In this presentation, we will take a look at Alma chapters 23 through 29. So let's begin with chapter 23 of Alma. Well, first we'll take a look at an introduction of Alma 23 through 29. The anti-Nephi Lehi's clearly demonstrated the powerful changes that come upon individuals who accept the gospel and make covenants to follow Jesus Christ. They provide an example of profound, full conversion that comes from a sincere effort to emulate the Savior in every aspect of life. Along with the converted Lamanites, the sons of Mosiah and Alma also showed the spiritual power that comes from the continuous desire to repent, to keep covenants, and to serve the Lord through missionary work and righteous living. As you study Alma 23 through 29, look for specific actions and attitudes that will help you deepen the strength of your personal conversion. Also look at the numerous descriptions of joy and rejoicing that come as a result. So with that, let's turn to Alma chapter 23. 23 verse 3, the phrase, the word of God might have no obstruction. The king of the Lamanites removed restrictions that had kept the gospel from being taught among his people, and the missionaries went forth preaching throughout the land. President Thomas S. Monson related a similar event as he described the circumstances surrounding the decision made by the government of the German Democratic Republic to allow missionaries to preach the land after years of restricted church activity. So this was before Germany was united. This was the communist part of Germany. Quote, Our ultimate goal was to seek permission for the doorway of mission work to open. Elder Russell M. Nelson, Elder Hans B. Ringer, and I, along with our local German Democratic Church leaders, headed by President Henry Burkhardt, President Frank Apel, and President Manfred Schutze, initially met with the Secretary of State of Religious Affairs, Kurt Loeffler, as he hosted a lovely luncheon in our honor. He addressed our group by saying, We want to be helpful to you. We've observed you and your people for 20 years. We know that you are what you profess to be, honest women, men and women. Government leaders and their wives attended the de dedication of a stake center at Dursden and a chapel at Zichrau. As the saint saying, God be with you till we meet again, offer Weidenschuren, off Weidenschuren, we remember him, the Prince of Peace, who died on the cross of Calvary. I contemplated our Lord and Savior when he walked the path of pain, the trail of tears, even the road of righteousness. His penetrating declaration came to mind, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the word giveth, world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Then it was back to Berlin for the crucial meeting with the head of the nation, even Chairman Heinrich Honecker. We were driven to the chambers of the chief representatives of the government. Beyond the exquisite entry to the building, we were greeted by Chairman Honecker. We presented him with the statuette First Sep, depicting a mother helping her child take its first step towards its father. He was highly pleased with the gift. He then escorted us into his private council room. There, around a large round table, we were seated. Others at the table included Chairman Honecker and his deputies of government. Chairman Honecker began, We know members of your church believe in work. You've proven that. We know you believe in the family. You've demonstrated that. We know you are good citizens in whatever country you claim as home. We have observed that. The floor is yours. Make your desires known. I began Chairman Honecker at the dedication open house of the temple in Freiburg. 89,890 of your countrymen stood in line at times up to four hours, frequently in the rain that they might see a house of God. In the city of Leipzig, at the dedication of the take dinner, 12,000 people attended the open house. In the city of Dresden, there were 29,000 visitors. In the city of Zwickau, 
5,300, and every week of the year, 1,500 to 1,800 people visit the temple grounds in the city of Freiburg. They want to know what we believe. We would like to tell them that we believe in honoring and sustaining, obeying and sustaining the law of the land. We would like to explain our desire to achieve strong family units. These are but two of our beliefs. We cannot answer questions and we cannot convey our feelings because we have no missionary representatives here as we, as we do in other countries. The young men and young women whom we would like to have come to your country as missionary representatives would love your nation and your people. More particularly, they would leave an influence with your people which would be ennobling. Then we would like to see young men and young women from your nation who are members of our church serve as missionary representatives in many nations, such as in America, in Canada, and a host of others. They will return better prepared to assume positions of responsibility in your land. Chairman Honecker then spoke for perhaps 30 minutes, describing his objectives and viewpoints and detailing the progress made by his nation. At length, he smiled and addressed me and the group, saying, We know you. We trust you. We have had experience with you. Your missionary request is approved. My spirit literally soared out of the room. The meeting was concluded. As we left the beautiful government chambers, Elder Russell M. Nelson turned to me and said, Notice how the sunshine is penetrating this hall. It's almost as though Heavenly Father is saying, I am pleased. The black darkness of night had ended. The bright light of day had dawned. The gospel of Jesus Christ would now be carried to the millions of people in that nation. Their questions concerning the church will be answered, and the kingdom of God will go forth. As I reflected on these events, my thoughts turned to the Master's words, In nothing doth man offend God, or against none is his wrath kindled, save those who confess not his hand in all things. I confess the hand of God in the miraculous events pertaining to the church in the German Democratic Republic. End of quote. What a marvelous miracle and story that was getting missionaries into a communist land. Chapter 23, verse 6, the phrase, the power of God working miracles in them. To mend a broken limb, to rid a body of disease, to raise the dead, all of these are into the soul. Previously, all of these are miracles indeed, yet miracles of a lesser order than the miracles of cleansing a soul from sin, breathing the breath of spiritual life into the soul previously dead to the things of the spirit, planting faith where they had been no faith, evoking righteousness where there had been none. Such are the great miracles that the gospel works upon people's hearts and souls. President Harold B. Lee stated, the greatest miracles I see today are not necessarily the healing of six sick bodies, but the greatest miracles I see are the healing of sick souls, those who are sick in soul and spirit and are downhearted and distraught on the verge of nervous breakdowns. End of quote. Chapter 23, verse 6, the phrase, And were converted unto the Lord, never did fall away. Two things are worthy of note here, namely the nature of the preaching done by the sons of Mosiah and the depth of the conversions. These two aspects of conversion are inextricably tied. These missionaries did not trifle with the Lamanites. They did not entertain them or seek by sophistry or by manipulation to bring people into the church. They preached the gospel. They preached creation, fall, and atonement. They preached faith, repentance, and rebirth. They preached Christ. That is, their message was substantive and sacred, and it was presented by the power of the Holy Ghost. Thus the listeners were converted to Christ, not to the missionaries or the other members of the church, as pleasant and sincere and dedicated as those might be. They were converted to Christ, and thus their testimony and their lives were built upon the only sure foundation. 
It is remarkable that not one of the anti-Nephi Lehi's ever left the church or became less active. President Gordon B. Hinckley has repeatedly stressed the importance of retaining recent converts. He has said there is no point in doing missionary work unless those converted stay active. Quote, with the increase of missionary work throughout the world, there must be a comparable increase in the effort to make every convert feel at home in his or her ward or branch. Enough people will come into the church this year to constitute more than 100 new average size stakes. Unfortunately, with this acceleration in conversions, we are neglecting some of these new members. I am hopeful that with great effort we'll go forward throughout the church, throughout the world, to retain every convert who comes into the church. This is serious business. There is no point in doing missionary work unless we hold on to the fruits of that effort. The two must be inseparable. End of quote. Chapter 23, verse 17, the phrase they called their names anti-Nephi-Lehi's. It is not clear exactly why they called themselves anti-Nephi-Lehi's. Viewing the word anti as meaning opposed to or against, perhaps their actions symbolized a desire to dissolve barriers between Nephites and Lamanites and thus establish peace. Their name could, in this sense, represent their opposition to a Nephi-Lehi distinction. That is, they wanted neither Nephites nor Lamanites or any manner of ites. Another possible suggestion suggests itself. Webster's Dictionary of 1828 indicates that the word anti means like or mere image of. In the case, antichrist would mean not just opposed to Christ, but also deceptively similar to Christ, and perhaps the name anti-Nephi-Lehi's would symbolize their desire to be as Nephi and Lehi of old. That is, they might remember the goodness and the faithfulness of their first Nephite prophet leaders. And so anti-Nephi-Lehi's may mean they're mirroring. They want to mirror the characteristics and qualities of Nephi and Lehi. The name anti-Nephi-Lehi could also indicate the joining together of the defend descendants of Nephi and those who follow him with other prosperity of Lehi. The name anti-Nephi-Lehi may be a reflex of the Egyptian entity, he of the one of. Thus, rather than having the sense against, it has the meaning, the one of Lehi and Nephi. So they wanted to become one of them, one like them. Let's now turn our attention to Alma chapter 24. 24 verses 1 through 4. The Lamanites, who had not been converted and had not taken upon them the name of anti-Nephi-Lehi, were stirred up by the Malachites and by the Amulonites to anger against their brethren. Not long after the Lamanite king and a great portion of his people were converted unto the Lord, the Amalekites, together with the Amulonites, by lies and deceit, fomented much trouble among the Lamanitish brethren who dwelt throughout the land of Nephi. This trouble was stirred up between the Lamanites and the converted ones of their race. It soon turned into hatred, which in itself is akin to murder. The Lamanites, instigated by the apostate Nephites, rebelled against the king. The apostates had refused to be governed by a Christian ruler in Zarahemla, and now they equally protested a like ruler in the land of Nephi. Those who chose to war against anti-Nephi-Lehi's had lost no freedoms by the conversion of the brethren. They had forfeited no rights. Wickedness hates righteousness and must, by its nature, war against it. Isn't that an interesting point? The apostates do not lose any freedoms or any liberties if someone converts to the true church of Christ. And so... Their stirring up anger is just pure wickedness. Wickedness must war against righteousness. The apostates of the true church must war against the truth. And so we see it here. 
Chapter 24, verse 6, the phrase, Now there was not one soul among all the people who had been converted unto the Lord that would take up their arms against their brethren, the Lamanites. Anti-Nephi-Lehi, their new king, commanded his subjects not even to make any preparations to meet the oncoming warfare, which he regarded as one in which brother would challenge brother in a struggle for life or death. Among all his people there was not one who disobeyed his mandate. They, as well as he, were filled with the righteous zeal which their new found faith inspired. They truly loved their brethren. Not one, we repeat, would take up arms even to defend himself. We can think of no more perfect illustration of the mighty change of heart spoken of by Alma than that illustrated by these converted Lamanites who now refuse to take up arms against those who would slay them. Theirs is an uncompromising confidence in the promises of God and a love for their brethren who have now declared themselves their enemies that exceeds their love for their own mortal lives. Chapter 24, verse 10, the phrase, Forgive us of those our many sins and murders. Because of the false tradition of their fathers, before their conversion, these Lamanites had taken life in unrighteous wars. Though such needless killing is a sin of the greatest magnitude, it is not the same as the willful and premeditated taking of life that, in the United States system of jurisprudence, is called first-degree murder, or that is spoken of in the scriptures as being sin unto death, meaning that, it, that its perpetrators cannot, even through repentance, obtain a glory greater than that of the telestial kingdom in the worlds to come. Chapter 24, verse 10, the phrase, Take away the guilt from our hearts through the merits of his son. President Boyd K. Packer, president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, testified that we can apply the atonement of Jesus Christ to remove our guilt. Quote, for some reason, we think the atonement of Christ applies only at the end of mortal life to redemption from the fall from spiritual death. It is much more than that. It is even ever present. It is an ever present power to call upon in everyday life. When we are racked or harrowed up or tormented by guilt or burdened with grief, he can heal us. While we do not fully understand how the atonement of Christ was made, we can experience the peace of God which passeth all understanding. We all make mistakes. Sometimes we harm ourselves and seriously injure others in ways that we alone cannot repair. We break things that we alone cannot fix. It is then in our nature to feel guilt and humiliation and suffering, which we alone cannot cure. That is when the healing power of the atonement will help. The Lord said, Behold, I, God, have suffered these things for all, that they might not suffer if they would repent. The atonement has practical, personal, everyday value. Apply it in your life. It can be activated with so simple a beginning as prayer. You will not thereafter be free from trouble and mistakes, but can erase the guilt through repentance and be at peace. End of quote. Chapter 24, verse 11, the phrase, For it was all we could do to repent. The anti nephi Levites did all that they could do to repent. In 2 Nephi 25-23, Nephi exclaimed, quote, It is by grace that we are saved after all that we can do. End of quote. From the king of the anti nephi Lehi's, we learn that part of all we can do is to repent of all our sins. That is the part we can do. And then Christ's grace can be activated to take care of the natural man and overcoming that which we cannot overcome alone. Chapter 24, verse 13, the phrase, which shall be shed for the atonement of our sins. Though it is true that the actual event of atonement lay in the future, from the days of Adam, men and women of faith called upon the Father in the name of the Son, pleaded for forgiveness by virtue of the precious blood that would be spilled in, spilled in the meridian of time, and knew the joy of their redemption through the merits and mercy of the Holy Messiah. 
So the atonement applied even before it actually happened. That's how much confidence the father had in the son, that the atonement could be used by the people prior to the Savior's suffering and sacrifice. Chapter 24, verse 15, the phrase, His word made us clean. Truth sanctifies the soul. See John 17, 17 through 19. To know the truth, to live the truth, to teach the truth, each has a sanctifying power upon our souls. Conversely, there can be no cleansing of the soul in ignorance, no exalting of the soul without our living the principles of exaltation, and no expansion of the soul in the refusal to share the light granted us. Chapter 24, verse 17 through 19, the phrase, They took their swords and they did bury them deep in the earth. This inspired covenant of the anti Nephilehites to bury their weapons and never again shed man's blood with them was renewed with great blessing, rewarded with great blessings. Notwithstanding, as we shall read, 1,005 of their number were later slain by the Lamanites. Some have attempted to extrapolate from this extrapolate from this instance that this is the course, a course of conscious objection that ought to be followed by those of the household of faith in all instances in which their lives and liberties are threatened by evil forces. But the larger context of this instance does not justify such an idea. As the story yet unfolds, it will be necessary for the anti nephilites to abandon their lands and move in a body to such to the land of Jershon, where they can be protected by the Nephites. It will also be necessary for their sons to have not and for their sons who have not entered into the covenant anti Nephi Lehi's made up to take arms to protect the Nephites and themselves from bondage. So just because the anti Nephi Lehi's made this covenant to f to be free of the stains of the many deaths they did commit in wars, they buried their weapons, does not mean that we do not take up arms to defend ourselves. This was a unique situation that was for the Nephi-Lehites. Nephi Scripture and God still gives us the right to defend our families and our homes and our liberties, even by war if necessary. Eventually, men and women must learn the lesson of the ages, a lesson stressed by Mormon just prior to his death, a message he could offer with over a thousand years of Nephite perspective before him. We know, he said to the future remnants of Israel, that ye must lay down your weapons of war and delight no more in the shedding of blood, and take them not again, save it be that God shall command you. That is when it is righteous. When God commands us to defend ourselves, then we are okay to go to war. By burying their weapons deep in the earth, the anti nephi Lehi's promised the Lord that they would never use them again. Scripture records that they were firm and would suffer even unto death rather than commit sin. Their actions demonstrated the complete abandonment of sin following sincere repentance. President Spencer W. Kimball taught that abandonment of sin often requires a change in lifestyle. Quote, in abandoning sin, one cannot merely wish for better conditions. He must make them. He may need to come to hate the spotted garments and loathe the sin. He must be certain not only that he has abandoned the sin, but he has changed the situation surrounding the sin. He should avoid the places and conditions and circumstances where the sin occurred, for these could most readily breed it again. He must abandon the people with whom the sin was committed. He may not hate the persons involved, but he must avoid them and everything associated with the sin. He must eliminate anything which would stir the old memories. End of quote. Chapter 24, verses 22 through 27. The examples of the righteous resulted in the conversion of many. Elder L. Tom Perry of the Quorum of the 
twelve apostles and remarked that our resolve to keep our covenants may lead to the conversion of others. He said, quote, the, kings, the king of the anti-Nephi Lehites instructed his people to bury their weapons deep into the ground, that they may not be tempted to use them when the Lamanite brother came to do battle against them. The people followed their king's instructions, viewing their actions as a testimony to God and also to men that they never would use weapons again for the shedding of man's blood. When the Lamanites attacked the Nephi-Lehites, went out to meet them and prostrated themselves on the ground before their attackers. The Lamanites killed a thousand and five of the anti-Nephi-Lehites before the slaughter stopped. Why did the slaughter stop and what were its consequences? From the account in Alma, we learn the answer to these questions. Now when the Lamanites saw this, they did forbear from slaying them. And there were many whose hearts had swollen, for they repented of the things which they had done. The people of God were joined that day by more than the number who had been slain. And those who had been slain were righteous people. Therefore, we have no reason to doubt, but they were saved. While the message of the story is not to insist on universal pacifism, we do learn that by not returning aggression from others, we can have a profound effect upon them. Literally, we can change their hearts when we follow Christ's example and turn the other cheek. Our examples as peaceful followers of Christ inspire others to follow him. End of his quote. Chapter 24, verse 26, the phrase, those who had been slain were righteous people. Therefore, we have no reason to doubt, but they were saved. When the righteous people die, we have no reason to doubt, but they, they are saved. That is, they are heirs of the celestial kingdom. When the righteous, those true to their gospel covenants, pass from this life to the next, they are received into a state of happiness, which is called paradise, a state of rest, a state of peace where they shall rest from all their troubles and all care and sorrow. Since they have kept their second estate, the eternal promise is that they shall have glory out upon their heads forever and ever. Given then that there is no apostasy in paradise, all who obtain that station have the sure promise of celestial glory in the day of resurrection. Brothers and sisters, do you catch that doctrine? The goal is to stay on the covenant path and die while we're on the covenant path. Then we go to paradise. Once in paradise, you will then grow and learn faster and you will be guaranteed salvation in the celestial and exaltation in the celestial kingdom. Chapter 24, verse 30, leaving neutral ground. A person who falls away from the church after having been a member is typically worse than if they had never known these things. The prophet Joseph Smith explained this position in a conversation with another member. A brother Isaac Behunin once told the prophet Joseph Smith, If I should leave this church, I would not do as other men have done. I would not go to some remote place where Mormonism has never been heard of. I would go to some remote place where Mormons never been heard of, settle down, and no one would ever learn that I knew anything about it. The great seer immediately replied, meaning Joseph Smith, Brother Behunin, you do not know what you would do. No doubt these men once thought as you do. Before you joined this church, you stood on neutral ground. When the gospel was preached, good and evil were set before you. You chose, you could choose either or neither. There were two opposite masters inviting you to serve them. When you joined this church, you enlist to serve God. When you did that, you left neutral ground and you can never get back on to it. Should you forsake the master you enlist to serve, it will be in the instigation of the evil one and you will follow his dictation and be his servant. End of quote. The rule for all ages seems to be that the most bitter enemies the prophets and kingdom of God will ever have are those who once embraced the faith and later were filled with an evil spirit and left. 
How strange it is that people leave the church of the world by the hundreds of thousands every year to embrace the restored gospel with no feelings of bitterness toward those churches they have left. Yet, when people leave the church of Jesus Christ, frequently they cannot leave it alone, but must wear out their lives in bitter attacks against it. As Joseph Smith attested, there is no neutrality where the church and the kingdom of God are concerned. Joseph Smith stated in 1834, quote, From apostates, the faithful had received the severest persecutions. Judas was rebuked and immediately betrayed his Lord into the hands of his enemies because Satan had entered into him. There is a superior intelligence bestowed upon such as they obey God, the gospel with full purpose of heart, with which, if sinned against, the apostate is left naked and destitute of the Spirit of God, and he is, in truth, nigh unto cursing, and his end is to be burned. When once that light which was in them is taken from them, they become as much darkened as they were previously enlightened, and then no marvel if all their power should be enlisted against the truth, and they, Judas-like, seek the destruction of those who are their greatest benefactors. What nearer friend on earth or in heaven had Judas than the Savior? And his, his first object was to destroy him. End of quote. Brothers and sisters, once we have entered the covenant path, please stay on it. We are better off staying on it than have never had known the truth. Let's now go to Alma chapter 25. Chapter 25, verses 1 through 12, prophecy fulfilled. Alma 25, 1 through 12 records the fulfillment of Abinadi's prophecy regarding the wicked priest of King Noah. Note how Mormon documented for the reader the fulfillment of the prophecies of Abinadi. Consider the result of those who reject the prophets like Abinadi and claim that the prophet has sinned. Modern revelation also contains a warning to those who lift up their hill against my anointed. It becomes obvious to some among the Lamanites that the power of God was with the Nephites. As they lamented their afflictions, they were reminded of the words of Aaron and his brethren who had spoken to them and realized that the traditions of their fathers were lies and vanities. Such thinking would have been regarded as traitor traitorous by the children of Amulon, who in the dark spirit of their father caused that the Lamanites who had started to believe in the Lord should be burned to death. In doing so, the seed of Amulon was fulfilling the prophecy of Abinadi, who, while he was being scorched by the flames that took his life, cried out, saying, Behold, even as ye have done unto me, so shall it come to pass that thy seed shall cause that many, many shall suffer the pains that I do suffer even the pains of death by fire, and this because they believe in the salvation of the Lord their God. 25 verse 8, the phrase, These martyrdoms caused that many of their brethren should be stirred up to anger. Those Lamanites who were converted unto the Lord and therefore were burned to death by the apostate Nephites had many relatives and sympathizers who came increasingly angry with the Amulonites because of the loss of their loved ones. Strife and resentment that daily became more bitter roused the malignant passions that were folded up in the breast of the savage Lamanites. To be ruled by the hated Nephites or them that they regarded as such was they thought bad enough but when these rulers exercised unjust authority or wicked dominion even to the taking of innocent lives open rebellion against the perpetrators thereof seemed to be the lamanites only recourse with each fire the amulites kindled the victims of the martyrs prior cried aloud for vengeance and it was not long until their united appeals brought the retribution upon the heads of the offending faithless Nephites. The Lamanites, unwilling to grapple any longer with the merciless rule of their usurpers, began to hunt the seed of Amulon and his brethren and began to slay them. The pursuit of the renegade Nephites did not end with the overthrow of their control of government. 
But the Lamanites followed the fleeing Amulites even further into the East Wilderness to avenge their wanton rule. This is one reason for Scripture to see that all promises, God promises and prophesies through promises, will all be fulfilled. And if He did it then, He will fulfill all promises to us now. We can have that assurance and faith in Christ. Chapter 25, verse 9, the phrasing, Behold, they are hunted this day by the Lamanites. This brought to pass the fulfillment of the prophecy uttered by Abinadi almost six or seventy years before, when he was brought before the wicked priests of still, of still more wicked King Noah, and by them was burned at the stake. But this much I tell you, what you do with me after this shall be a type and a shadow of things which are to come. Chapter 25, verses 13 through 17. It is a genuine conversion to Christ of which we read, not a military surrender. Those reborn disciples join the anti nephi in bearing their weapons of war, in walking in the ways of the Lord, in observance of the law of Moses with all its ritual and understanding of its purposes as a type for the coming of Christ. Theirs was not a conversion of convenience, but rather one representing a total commitment to Christ. Abinadi had explained to the priest of Noah, and now ye have said that salvation cometh by the law of Moses. I say unto you that, this is that it is expedient that you should keep the law of Moses as yet, but I say unto you that the time shall come when it shall no more be expedient to keep the law of Moses. And moreover, I say unto you that salvation doth, that should be, doth not come by the law alone. And were it not for the atonement which God himself make, for the sins and iniquities of a people, that they must unavoidably perish, notwithstanding the law of Moses. Let's change that to doth. So too, today, salvation cometh not by the ordinances and covenants of the gospel alone. They should be used to point us to Christ and to rely on His merits and grace for eternal life. Without Christ, repentance, going to the temple, and going on missions is all meaningless without His atonement. So all of those things should point us to Him and His atonement if they're going to be effective in helping us develop faith in Christ. One of the great lessons that emerges from this section of the book of Alma is that God always keeps his promises. The Lord had told King Mosiah that many would believe his son's teachings and that he would deliver them out of the hands of the Lamanites. For the fulfillment of these promises, see Alma 17, 4, 35-39, chapter 19, 22-23, and chapter 26, 1-4. This is just one of the numerous scriptural illustrations that reinforce the doctrinal truth that God is bound when we do what he says. Let's now go to Alma chapter 26. Alma 26 verse 4, thousands of them do rejoice. Gospel principles properly understood cause the hearts and souls of men to rejoice. It is prophesied that when the lost sheep of Israel return to the fold of God in the last days, they will do so with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads that in their conversion they will experience joy and gladness, and that sorrow and sighing shall flee from them. Even in the pre-existence when the plan of salvation was announced, the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Well, we need to remember that when we go through hardships down here, brothers and sisters, when this was all presented to us and shown us the, what the plan would be and that what mature, mortal life would be like, that there would be trials, afflictions, and infirmities, we still all shouted for joy. 26 verses 5 through 7. What are sheaves? The word sheaves means quantities of stalks and heads of grain bound together. Ammon's mention of sheaves in Alma 26.5 refers to the converts brought into the church by faithful missionaries who thrust in their sickles. Chapter 26, verse 6, the phrase, they shall be gathered together in their place that the storm cannot penetrate to them. 
Ammon's promise was prophetic. He was raised to the highest point of inspired utterance. He foretold that only a few months later proved to be history. The anti nephi Lehi's afterward called Ammonites in honor of the greatest of Mosiah's sons migrated in vast numbers to the land which the Nephites in their magnanimity had provided for them. Between this new land, which was called Jerson, and their former home in the land of Nephi lay Zarahemla, where the main body of the Nephites dwelt. Here the Ammonites were safe from the sworn vengeance of their erstwhile compatriots, the Lamanites, and here was fulfilled the prophecy which is recorded in this verse. The storm, when it came, and the fierce winds that blew did not penetrate to them, for the armies of the Nephites were placed between the Anti-Nephi-Lehi's, or the Ammonites, as now they were called, and their enemies. Behold, said Ammon, they are in the hands of the Lord of the harvest, and they are his, and he will raise them up at the last day. Chapter 26, verse 8, the phrase, Let us sing to his praise. Music and song have been an important part of worship among the saints in all gospel dispensation. The praise of God has ascended to the heavens through the sweetest sounds of the harpist and the thundering majesty of great choirs. While but one can speak a time in worship service, all can unite in hymns or anthems of praise to our God. Whereas the individual shout of adulation may be deemed in in decorous mean unbecoming to raise our voices and harmonious strains of praise exalts the soul and makes the heavens echo with our testimony of his mercy and goodness as the term is used in this passage however Ammon feels the need to sing praises to god in the same sense that one sings the song of redeeming love we sing to the praise of the Almighty as we keep his commandments, as we express gratitude in prayer, as we acknowledge his hand in all things. Chapter 26, verse 10, the phrase, I fear that thou dost, that thy joy doth carry thee away into boasting. Aaron's concern is a valid one. We must always be on the alert to avoid boasting about our accomplishments even if, perhaps especially if, the accomplishments were in the spiritual realm. Few persons are able to keep an eye single to the glory of God to such an extent that they look to God and acknowledge his hand in all things. 26 verse 11, the phrase, my joy is full. In the ultimate sense, one cannot have a fullness of joy in this life, but only in and after the resurrection. There is there is a joy however which comes to those who share the message of the gospel a joy which transcends earthly pleasures chapter 26 verse 12 the phrase i know that i am nothing man is nothing moses declared after having viewed the expanse of eternity and after learning of the majesty and power of god yet when the power of god is placed upon us our endowment that assuming worthiness on our part is rightfully ours as his offspring we can do all things in his name in short man is nothing without divine intervention when compared with god's ammon knew that his utmost strength was absolute weakness and his wisdom foolishness he did not boast in them but however the light of god's countenance illuminated his soul and what had been dark within him was now made bright like a lamp in the gloomy wastes of darkness his joy spread its rays of gladness all about him and it beckoned his brethren behold my joy is full yea my heart is brim with joy and i will rejoice in my god the phrase in his strength i can do all things paul wrote i can do all things through christ which strengtheneth me brother and sister without christ we literally are nothing but with Christ, we can become everything, even joint heirs to Jesus Christ and Heavenly Father. Chapter 26, verse 13, the phrase, How many thousands of our brethren has he loosed from the pains of hell? They are loosed from the pains of hell here and hereafter. Many suffer hell on earth in the sense that they are smitten by conscience, tormented by a damned soul that cannot find happiness in sin. 
of necessity, those who die under the bondage of sin are consigned hereafter to that portion of the spirit world referred to in the Book of Mormon as hell, where they must pay for their sins. Here there shall be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, and this because of their own iniquities being led captive by the will of the devil. Thus, as Ammon states, this great host of Lamanite converts have escaped the pains of hell, as do all who repent, are baptized, and continue in the faith. Chapter 26, verses 15 through 16, the phrase, Who can glory too much in the Lord? Just as Ammon felt the glory in the Lord and to sing his praises, so should we. Sister Sherry L. Dew, while serving as a counselor in the Reef Society General Presidency, taught us concerning the role Jesus Christ plays in our daily lives. She said, quote, Is it possible to be happy when life is hard, to feel peace amid uncertainty and hope in the midst of cynicism? Is it possible to change, change to shake off old habits and become new again? Is it possible to live with integrity and purity in a world that no longer values the virtues that distinguish the followers of Christ? Yes, the answer is yes, because of Jesus Christ, whose atonement assures us that we need not bear the burdens of mortality alone. Through the years, I, like you, have experienced pressures and disappointments that would have crushed me had I not been able to draw upon a source of wisdom and strength far greater than my own. He has never forgotten or forsaken me, and I have come to know for myself that Jesus is the Christ, that he, this is his church. With Ammon, I say, for who can glory too much in the Lord? Yea, who can say too much of his great power and his mercy? Behold, I cannot say the smallest part which I feel. I testify that in this, the twilight of the dispensation of the fullness of times, when Lucifer is working overtime to jeopardize our journey home and to separate us from the Savior's atoning power, the only answer for any of us is Jesus Christ. I testify to that, that that is true. Christ is the answer. Christ is everything. Everything must be about Christ. Chapter 26, verse 19, the phrase, the sword of his justice. If God be God, he must be just, and justice demands that the Lord of hosts take up his sword against those who war against him and desire to destroy his kingdom. Isaiah spoke of its sword, its sword bathed in heaven, meaning either anointed or or drunk to its full, with which he will come down upon the world in judgment. Chapter 26, verse 20, the phrase, In his great mercy hath brought us over that everlasting gulf of death and misery. Only the mercy of God could conquer the effects of death and the misery of sin, such as the effect of the atoning sacrifice of Christ. It extends to everyone the blessing of resurrection, the endless union of body and spirit, and to the faithful repent, it grants the promise of exaltation. God is just and merciful. If you want him to be merciful, then it's based upon the conditions of repentance. If you choose not to repent, then God must bring just judgment down upon the wicked. It's up to us, brothers and sisters, which one we choose. Chapter 26, verses 21 through 22, the phrase, What natural man is there that knoweth these things? King Benjamin declared that the natural man to be an enemy to God. Ammon here describes the natural man as the man who is without repentance, faith, good works, and constant prayer. A person ceases to be a natural man when the Holy Ghost becomes his companion. The natural man is the man devoid of the spirit of prophecy and revelation. The man of God, as contrasted with the natural man, has the promise that he may know things that are not generally known, and that he may be an instrument for righteousness in the hands of God, to bring many unto repentance. The promise is not appended to a priesthood office or a particular calling. Indeed, the promise is not limited to men. It is extended to every faithful member of the church. 26 verses 23 through 26 they laughed us to they laugh us to scorn 
It is an interesting reversal of positions to have their fellow Nephites laugh the sons of Mosiah to scorn because of their righteous desires, when those now scorning had a short time before been subjects to the others' faithless tauntings. It is also interesting to learn that there were some among the Nephites who felt that the sword was the proper solution to their problems with the Lamanites. It is obvious that it took both greater faith and greater courage to do missionary work among them than it took to go to battle against them. Nevertheless, it is the purpose of the Lord, whenever possible, to save, not to destroy, the wayward nations of the earth. Chapter 26, verse 27, Perseverance Leads to Success. The success the sons of Mosiah experienced among the Lamanites exceeded their expectations. As they began their missions, the Lord promised, I will make an instrument of thee in my hands unto the salvation of many souls. With this promise, they took courage to go forth unto the Lamanites to declare unto them the word of God. Success in their endeavors did not come automatically, even though the Lord had promised it. During the course of their 14-year mission, they experienced all manner of afflictions. The record further indicates their hearts had become depressed and they were about to turn back. Yet, trusting in the promise of the Lord, they continued their efforts. Then, as he always does, the Lord honored his promises and rewards their perseverance. Chapter 26, verses 28 through 30. The realities of missionary service is it is work, hard work. Elder F. Burton Howard of the 70s shared how his re reading of Alma 26 as young missionaries impacted his testimony of the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon. He said, quote, I was reading again the 26th chapter of Alma and the story of Ammon's mission. I read out loud, as I sometimes do, trying to put myself in the position of the characters in the book, imagining that I was saying or hearing the words that I was there. Once more I went over the report, and with a clarity which cannot be described, and which would be difficult to comprehend by one who has not experienced, the Spirit spoke to my soul, saying, Did you notice? Everything that happened to Ammon happened to you. It was a total unexpected sentiment. It was startling in its scope. It was a thought that had never occurred to me before. I quickly reread the story. Yes, there were times when my heart had been depressed and I had thought about going home. I too had gone to a foreign land to teach the gospel to the Lamanites. I had gone forth among them, had suffered hardship, had slept on the floor, endured the cold, gone without eating. I too had traveled from house to house, knocking on doors for months at a time, without being invited in, relying on the mercies of God. There had been other times when we had entered houses and talked to the people, when he had taught them on the streets and on their hills. We had even preached in other churches. I remember the time I had been spit upon. I remember the time when I was a young district leader assigned by the mission president to open up a new town and entered with three other elders, the main square of a city that had never had missionaries before. We went into the park, sang a hymn, and a crowd gathered. Then the lot fell on me. The lot fell on me as district leader to preach. I stood upon a stone bench and spoke to the people. I told the story of the restoration of the gospel, of the boy Joseph going to the grove and appearing to the father and the son to him. I remembered well a group of teenage boys in the evening shadows throwing rocks at us. I remember the concern about being hit or injured by those who did not want to hear the message. I remember spending time in jail while my legal rights to be a missionary in a certain country was decided by a police authorities. I didn't spend enough time in prison to compare myself to Ammon, but I still remember the feeling I had when the door was closed and I was far away from home along with only the mercies of the Lord to rely on for deliverance. I remembered enduring these things with the hope that we might be the means of saving some souls. And then, on that day, as I read, the Spirit testified to me again, the words remaining with me even today. No one but a missionary could have written this story. Joseph Smith could never have known what it was like to be a missionary to the Lamanites, for no one he knew had ever done such a thing before. End of quote. What a great testimony that Joseph did not write the Book of Mormon. He couldn't have put those details in. 
like they said, he had never experienced those before. And so what a witness that the Book of Mormon was translated by the gift and power of God by Joseph, not written by him. Chapter 26, verse 35, here are some different phrases. First, he has all power. God has all power. There is no righteous deed or work that he cannot do. There are no laws that he did not ordain. Joseph Smith said it thus, quote, Unless God had all power over all things and was able by his power to control all things and thereby deliver his creatures who put their trust in him from the power of all beings that might seek their destruction, whether in heaven or on earth or in hell, man could not be saved. End of quote. The phrase all wisdom. God has all wisdom. Wisdom is a gift of God. Indeed, there is no wisdom save it has come from God. Wisdom embraces the wise application of knowledge and an understanding of that which is one's eternal best interest. Wisdom comes as a person applies his heart to understanding. Brothers and sisters, we gain wisdom as we apply righteous truths in our life. The phrase all understanding, great is our God and our and of great power, his understanding is infinite. The phrase, he comprehendeth all things. He comprehendeth all things, and all things are before him, and all things are round about him, and he is above all things, and in all things, and is through all things, and is round about all things, and all things are by him, and of him, even God forever and ever. No wonder we can put our complete trust in him. The phrase, the phrase, a merciful being to those who will repent. Alma taught that whosoever repenteth shall find mercy, and he that findeth mercy and endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. Thus, in the full and complete sense, to obtain the mercy of the Lord is to obtain salvation. In a similar sense, the Lord said, I, the Lord, am merciful and gracious unto those who fear me and delight to honor those who serve me in righteousness and in truth unto the end. To fear the Lord means to have respect and awe. Mercy is not showered per promiscuously upon mankind, wrote Elder Bruce R. McConkie, except in the general sense that it is manifest in the creation and peopling of the earth and in the granting of immortality to all men as a free gift, immortality meaning the resurrection. Rather, mercy is granted because of the grace, love, and condescension of God, as it is with all beings to those who comply with the law upon which its receipt is predicated. That law is the law of righteousness. Those who show righteous re re reap mercy. There is no promise of mercy to the wicked. Rather, as stated in the Ten Commandments, the Lord promised to show mercy unto thousands of them that love him and keep his commandments. Chapter 26, verse 36, the phrase, a branch of the tree of Israel lost from its body. Reference is to the Lamanites who lost the knowledge of the rightful inheritance through wickedness and rebellion. This is the same sense in which the tribes of Israel are lost in our day. Not in the sense that they are hidden in some unknown place trying to find their way back, but rather they have become temporarily lost as to their identity and thus as to their place in the master's fold. They await the shepherds he sends to search them out from the nations of the earth. That is what we call the gathering of Israel. 26 verse 37, the phrase, God is mindful to every people. The God of whom Ammon bore witness was not a local God with bounded powers and limited interest. His love was not confined to some small fragment of the earth's population. Neither was his power to bless or to save rationed among a favored few. There are none to whom the gospel will not go, whether it be in this life or the next. There are none who cannot obtain the assurance of salvation through obedience to the laws and ordinance of the gospel. There are none for whom the atonement of Christ does not bring an everlasting restoration of body and spirit. None who through worthiness can obtain all that the Father has. A theology that promises less would be unworthy of our allegiance, unworthy of our God. Let's now turn to Alma chapter 27. Chapter 27, verse 1. The phrase, it was in vain to seek their destruction. 
As long as the Nephite nation was worthy of the protection of the Lord, it was vain for other people or nations to seek his destruction. This is inherent in the concept of a covenant people being granted a promised land. The land is the symbol of the covenant they have made. As long as they honor their covenants, they retain the promise of protection. In the violation of their covenants, they forfeit the right to divine protection and no longer have claim upon the land. Chapter 27, verse 2, the phrase Amalekites began to stir up the people in anger against the brethren, the people of anti-Nephi-Lehi. The Amalekites, who are apostate Nephites, who personify the spirit of apostasy, having once partaken of the fruit of the tree of life and then turn against it, now devote their whole energy to the, of their souls to fighting God. Since they can find no success in war with the Nephites, they turn on their brethren, the anti-Nephi-Lehites, seeking their destruction. All who have embraced light and truth are of necessity their enemies. Chapter 27, 4 through 14. Ammon, as the prophet leader of his people, having in a spiritual sense led them to God, now leads them to a temporal salvation, a land of safety. In so doing, he becomes a rather remarkable type for the Messiah, who will also first offer the doctrines of the kingdom and eventually lead all who have embraced those doctrines to a place of safety. Similarly, as we are about to read, these people will be given Ammon's name, even as all the faithful must be given the name of our Lord. And master. Chapter 27, verse 4. The phrase treated as though they were angels sent from God. I'm sorry for the type of that. There's an extra four that should not be there. The angel is a messenger from the Lord. The Hebrew word malak, for which instance means messenger, representative, or angel. In the context of Old Testament, it is used in reference to both human and spirit messengers. For that matter, those who come in the name of the Savior ought to be accorded the same respect that would be granted the Master. This was the spirit in which those in Galatia received the Apostle Paul. Of that reception, he wrote, My temptation was in my flesh, yet despised not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ. Chapter 27, verses 17 through 19, the phrase, the joy of Ammon was so great, even that he was full. A fullness's joy is found only among resurrected, exalted beings. Indeed, exaltation consists in gaining a, full, gaining a fullness of joy. It is to enter into the joy of the Lord. Immortality men experience joy only in righteousness, that is, in obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel, the gospel being the glad tidings of great joy. Joy is characteristic of the presence of the Holy Ghost from whom it comes. It is experienced only when the Spirit is present, and that most acutely in the manifestation that our sins have been remitted, in the knowledge that our path is pleasing to and approved by God and in our helping others find the way to light and salvation. Chapter 27, verses 21 through 24, Forgiving Our Enemies. Alma had previously called upon the inhabitants of Zarahemla to change their hearts. He also declared that the Lord sendeth an invitation unto all men. This matches a similar invitation by the Lord through Nephi, that God denieth none that come unto him, black and white, bond and free, male and female, all are alike unto God. The inhabitants of Zarahemla embrace Alma's message, and when it becomes necessary to forgive their enemies, they offered land and protection to the people of Alma. All are alike unto God, but there are certain times and certain places when the gospel will be sent to all those people. They are sent on God's timetable, not on our timetable. And so God decides when a certain nation or people will receive the gospel. But between this life and the next, all will have the opportunity to hear it. President Howard W. Hunter admonished each of us to similarly forgive our enemies. Quote, consider, for example, this instruction from Christ to his disciples. He said, love your enemies, bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Think what this 
admonition alone would do in your neighborhood and mine, in the communities in which you and your children live, in the nations which make up our great global family. I realize this doctrine poses a significant challenge, but surely it is more agreeable challenge than the terrible task posed for us by the war, by the war and poverty and pain the world continues to face. We all have significant opportunities to practice Christianity, and we should try it at every opportunity. For example, we can all be a little more forgiving. End of quote. Chapter 27, verses 27 through 30. He that is righteous is favored of God. Such was the case with the people of Ammon, a people perfectly honest and upright in all things, a people firm in the faith of Christ, a people who looked upon their past sins with abhorrence, a people who, because of their abiding faith in the atonement of Christ and the power of the resurrection, did not fear death. Surely the heavens rejoiced over them, and the righteous of all generations ought to emulate them. Brother and sister, God does favor people, but we are the ones who choose whether he favors us or not. He will favor all those who come unto him through his son, Jesus Christ. So it's us that makes the choice whether God favors us. Not that he has just certain favorites and not others. All can become his favorites if we so choose. Chapter 27, verse 28, the phrase, Never did look upon death with any degree of terror. It is a contradiction to profess saving faith and yet to cling tenaciously to life and to be terrified by death. If our faith does not reach beyond the shadow of death, we are, as Paul said, of all men, most miserable. Those that die in me, the Lord promised, shall not taste of death, for it shall be sweet unto them. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Chapter 27, verse 30. They were a zealous and beloved people. Some people have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. That is, their zeal, excitement, enthusiasm, eagerness is not refined by the wisdom and judgment that must accompany righteous actions. Others, like the people of Ammon, had a zeal for righteousness, but a zeal that was tempered by common sense and by the quiet peace which whispereth that the Lord is pleased. We now go to Alma, chapter 28. 28 verses 1 through 12. The phrase, hope follows the death of the righteous. Elder Robert D. Hells, the quorum of the twelve, shared the following experience he had with the righteous priesthood leader dying of a terminal disease. Quote, My friend came to accept the phrase, Thy will be done, as he faced his own poignant trials and tribulations. As a faithful member of the church, he was now confronted with some sobering concerns. Particularly touching were his questions, Have I done all that I need to do faithfully endure to the end? What will death be like? Will my family be prepared to stand in faith and be self-reliant when I am gone? We had the opportunity to discuss all three questions. They are clearly answered in the doctrine taught to us by our Savior. We discussed how he had spent his life striving to be faithful, to do what God asked of him, to be honest in his dealings with his fellow man and all others, to care for and love his family. Isn't that what was meant by enduring to the end? We talked about what happens immediately after death, about how God has taught us about the world of spirits. It is a place of paradise and happiness for those who have lived righteous lives. It is not something to fear. After our conversion, conversation, he called together his wife and his extended family, children and grandchildren, to teach them, and again, the doctor of the atonement, that all will be resurrected. Everyone come to an understanding that just as the Lord has said, while there will be mourning at the temporary separation, there is no sorrow for those who die in the Lord. His prom blessings promise him comfort and reassurance that all would be well, that he would not have pain, that he would have additional time to prepare his family for his departure, and even that he would know the time of his departure. The family related to me that on the night before he passed away, he said he would go on the morrow. He passed away the next afternoon at peace, all with all of his family at his side. This is the solace and comfort that comes to us when we understand the gospel plan and know that families are forever. 
contrasting these events with the incident which happened to me when I was a young man in my early 20s. While serving in the Air Force, one of the pilots of my squadron crashed on a training mission and was killed. I was assigned to accompany my fallen comrade on his final journey home to be buried in Brooklyn. I had the honor of standing by his family during the viewing and funeral service and of representing our government in presenting the flag to his grieving widow at the graveside. The funeral service was dark and dismal. No mention was made of his goodness or his compliments. His name was never mentioned. At the conclusion of the service, his widow turned to me and asked, Bob, what is really going to happen to Don? I was then able to give her the sweet doctrine of the resurrection and the reality that if baptized and sealed in the temple for time and all eternity, they could be together eternally. The clergyman standing next to me said, that is the most beautiful doctrine I have ever heard. End of quote. And so it is, brothers and sisters. Death is just another way for us to be born again and become like Christ. Just as in a sense we had to die leaving the prayer's life to be born into this life. Chapter 28, verse 8, Sorrows, Afflictions, Incomprehensible Joy. This strange but common threesome kept capsulizes not only the mission experience of the sons of Messiah, but also the experience of countless other missionaries and apostles of the Lord, as they have gone forth to the nations and peoples of the earth. Indeed, the Son of Man himself was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Yet notwithstanding the difficulties associated with labor in the Lord's cause, we are assured that the eye hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Chapter 28, verse 12, the phrase, a state of never-ending happiness. The righteous will know happiness in paradise, in the resurrection, and throughout the ages, endless ages of eternity. It is their right to sit down in the kingdom of heaven with the righteous progenitors to go no more out. Chapter 28, verse 13, and the phrase, and thus we see how great the iniquity of man is because of sin and transgression. No lesson presented in the Nephite record is more vividly shown or as frequently given than the one here that Mormon emphasizes. He stresses the point that it is sin and transgression and the power of the devil that divides men into class and class distinctions. We may trace many Nephite woes to pride and self-anointed righteousness. The ambitions of Amlicite to be king of the Nephites is an example of what we mean. His desire to exercise unrighteous authority over his brethren started with pride, which endured, had its beginning in the things of the world, which he and his followers had accumulated. His wicked aim was to destroy the republic, which God inspired. Satan put into Amalekite's heart to aspire to kingship and then by overthrow the work of the Lord. In this way, the Nephites were divided into two classes, those who had, who hoped to profit by Amalekite's wicked venture and those who stood fast with Alma and upholding the law of the land. The evil intent of the Amalekite not only divided the Nephites into two groups, but it resulted into open warfare in which inter, inter, in which internecine strife thousands of Nephites on both sides were slain. The cunning plans which Satan puts into Amalekite's heart fell to thwart the purposes of God. Mormons saw in the experience of these 15 years that God will not forsake his people, nor, as the psalmist says, leave them in their grief when they earnestly seek to do his will. In other words, there is nothing that equalizes men more than does righteous behavior. We all stand before God as equals, save those who do and those who do, save those who do and those who do not obey his words. There is nothing that equalizes men more than by them walking together with the Lord. Again, how often this truth is made known to us when we study the Nephite scriptures. Now to our last chapter, Alma, chapter 29. Chapter 29, 1 through 3, the phrase, Oh, that I were an angel. In this beautiful and spirit-filled expression, Alma wishes for the voice of an angel and the spiritual power to declare the message of salvation to every people upon the face of the earth. 
Perhaps his desire to affect the world of good was just as the angel who appeared to him and the sons of Mosiah had dramatically affected the course of events in Nephite history. He then chides himself, saying, I do sin on my wish, and concludes that he ought to be content with the office and calling the Lord has given him. In the verses that follow, he declares that the Lord grants to all men according to their desires. What then of his desire to raise the warning voice among all nations? I it not to be noted that through the going forth of the Book of Mormon, Alma does indeed speak with the eloquence of an angel to those of every nation, kindred, and tongue? Ought it not be noted also that there was no sin in his desire to declare the gospel to the peoples of the earth, and that the people, by the tens of thousands, yes, by tens of millions, will yet hear his voice as the voice of an angel echoing through the ages to touching their hearts and direct their course? The earth has no few teachers to the equal of Alma the Younger. Isn't that an interesting insight? He wished that he could teach all nations, kindreds, and people, and brothers and sisters. He is doing that through leaving his account in the Book of Mormon, which is going to all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people. He truly got the desire of his heart. Chapter 29, verses 4 through 5. The phrase, God grant to the men according to their desires. Elder Nellie Maxwell, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, taught that our desires affect our personal development and eventually determine our eternal blessings. Quote, desires become real determinants even when with, pitif with pitiful naivety we do not really want the consequences of our desires. Therefore, what we in insistently desire over time is what we will eventually become and what we will receive in eternity. Righteous desires need to be relentless. Therefore, because, said President Brigham, the men and women whose desire to obtain seats in the celestial kingdom will find that they must battle every day. Therefore, true Christian soldiers are more than weekend warriors. Remember, brothers and sisters, it is our own desires which determine the sizing and the attractiveness of various temptations. We set our own thermostats as to temptations. Thus, educating and training our desires clearly requires understanding the truths of the gospel, yet even more is involved. President Brigham Young confirms saying, it is evident that many who understand the truth do not govern themselves by it. Consequently, no matter how true and beautiful truth is, you have to take the passions of the people and mold them to the law of God. Therefore, declared President Joseph F. Smith, the education then of our desires is one of far-reaching importance to our happiness in life. Such education can only lead to sanctification until, said President Brigham Young, holy desires produce corresponding outward works. Only by educating and training our desires can they become our allies instead of our enemies. End of Elder Maxwell's quote. We must be careful what we desire. Do we want the consequences of what we desire? Make sure you want the consequences of what you want. 29 verse 5, the phrase, He that knoweth good and evil, to him it is given according to his desires. Given the necessary time, both the righteous and the unrighteous desires of our hearts will find a way to express themselves. This is a simple manifestation of the verity that desires govern our choices, and choices take us where we, where we really want to go. It is also inherent in the plan of salvation that judgment involves involve a perfect blend of works and desires. Thus, if we really wanted to do something, be it good or evil, but were unable to do it because of circumstances beyond our control, short of our repenting, a just God will reward or punish us if we had actually done it. See, only an all-knowing true God can actually bring such judgment. The law of God can reward a righteous desire or attitude because an omniscient God can determine it. Elder Dallin H. Oaks has written, If a person does not perform a particular commandment because he is genuinely unable to do so, but truly would if he could, our Heavenly Father will know this and will reward that person accordingly. 
upon the same principle, evil thoughts or desires are sinful under the laws of God, even though not translated into actions that would make them punishable under the laws of man. Similarly, if a person performs a seemingly righteous act, but does so for the wrong reasons, such as to achieve a selfish purpose, his hands may be clean, but his heart is not pure. His acts will not be counted for righteousness. End of quote. Chapter 29, verse 8, the phrase, the Lord that grant unto all nations of their, of their, the Lord grant unto all nations of their own nation and tongue to teach his word. As the treasures of heaven are rationed to men according to the preparations they, they have made, so it is with nations. They to receive heaven's light as they have prepared themselves for it and as they are worthy to receive it. Thus, as some people have been favored of God and greatly blessed, conversely, some nations, some people have chosen to be hard-hearted and to walk in darkness. God is merciful and gracious. He bestows upon the individuals and nations that degree of eternal light which they are equipped and prepared to receive. See, for him to give knowledge and light to a people that aren't prepared, it would only condemn them. And so if they're not ready for it, it does not give them to them as an act of love. He is the Father and the God of all men and women of all ages, all cultures, and his love for them is as great as it is for the Christian nations or the Latter-day Saints. It is a doctrine of the true church that the Almighty has granted a portion of his light to such notables as Socrates, Confucius, Buddha, the Reformers, and many, many others, in order that the whole nations might be lifted to higher standards of living. Ultimately, of course, there is only one standard, the sta gospel standard, and God will provide an opportunity for every soul to receive the fullness of the everlasting gospel, either in this world or in the world to come. Prophetically, we have been told that the restored gospel must go to those of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. A revelation to Joseph Smith adds that the message of the restoration must go to all nations in their own language. Alma's declaration suggests that only that not only must it go to all nations in their own language, but it must be also be declared by their own people. That is, the gospel must yet be taught in Russia by Russians, elders in China by by Chinese elders, and so forth throughout the nations of the earth. Such a view is in harmony with Nephi's vision of the last days, in which he saw a congregation of saints upon all faces of the earth before the return of Christ. Chapter 29, verse 12, the phrase, I have always remembered. Memory is a powerful motivator to righteousness. The repentant cedar need only remember the agony and suffering suffering through which he once passed on the road to spiritual recovery. The prosperous man only need remember an earlier life when food and clothing and shelter were more difficult to obtain. And a free people need only reflect seriously upon a time when the living God miraculously delivered them or their ancestors from bondage. Thus we see the importance to remember the past sacrifices made in our behalf. President Spencer W. Kimball taught of the great importance that the memory plays in our spirituality. Quote, when you look in the dictionary for the most important word, what do you know what it is? It could be remember, because all of you have made covenants. You know what to do. You know how to do them. Our greatest need is to remember. That is why everyone goes to sacrament meeting every Sunday, Sabbath day, to take the sacrament, to listen to the priest pray that they may always remember him and keep his commandments which he has given them. Nobody should ever forget to go to sacrament meeting. Remember is the word. Remember is the program. End of quote. Chapter 20, verse 17, that they may go no more out. That is, may they, through God's help, stay faithful and forever intact in the fold of the Good Shepherd. May they never wander from the straight and narrow path. Mortality is a probationary estate in which even the sanctified are warned to take heed, lest they fall. Those who in death obtain paradise for the rest of the Lord are no longer in a probationary state. For the faithful, the day of probation ends at the time of death. Satan can no longer have any power over them. Do you hear that, brothers and sisters? Those who go to paradise, Satan no longer has power over them. He does those in spirit prison, but not those in paradise. 
how much faster you think we can learn that in the spirit world in paradise when we've finally gotten rid of Satan off our back. Thank you for watching. Hopefully this helped you with some doctrine principles and coming unto Christ. If it did, please hit the like button.